I'm going to start with a story. But before I do that, I have a word for someone this morning. It's um, from Isaiah 49, from verse 15. Verse 15. It says, can a woman forget a sucking child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? It says, yea, they may forget, yet will I not forget you. It says, behold, I have engraven you, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. We've been speaking about exchanges this morning and about renewed hope this morning. And I feel that God would have me say that to someone, that I have not forgotten you. I'm with you in your struggles. I'm with you in your pain. I'm with you on that journey. I have not forgotten you. So as you go into this week, I would encourage you to hold on to that word. Remind God of that word and say to him, Lord, I thank you because you've not forgotten me. I thank you because you are with me on this journey. Amen. All right, um, so I'm going to start off with a story really quickly. A couple of months back, I um, read this woman's story online. Um, she talked about how, so she had just become a Christian, I think about five months before that time, and she had closed from work on this particular day, and she felt a very strong nudge um, not to go home, but to go the opposite direction. So she was meant to go to the car park to get her car and leave, but she felt a very strong urge to go towards the park. So there was a park opposite the car park. So she um, struggled initially, but eventually she did. And she started walking towards this park. And on her way to the park, she met an old friend who apparently was an atheist. And they got talking. Um, when they got to the park, you know, she started sharing her faith. She was really excited and just, you know, sharing with him how she had become a Christian and all God was doing in her life. And this guy was just like, yeah, I hear you, but it's not my cup of tea. Anyways, um, they, you know, part ways, she goes back. And on her way, she started thinking, wow, maybe God wanted me to share my story, my faith with this guy. And, you know, she thanked God and she left it there. A year after someone walks up to her after a church service like this. And he said to her, you might not know me, but about a year ago, I overheard you at the park with a, speaking to a gentleman about your faith. He said, at that point in time, I had questions about my faith. I was ready to give up on faith. I was ready to give up on God. But I was sat right behind you at the park, and I overheard your conversation, and I felt God speak to me through your story through the joy that you shared with that gentleman, and it changed everything for me. And I went back home. I rededicated my life to Christ, and I'm here. I'm here in church today again because of what you shared with that gentleman. Here was this lady thinking a story was for um, the atheist, whereas God was doing something else with that story. I shared this story because it speaks to the heart of what we'll be um, speaking about this morning which is um, sharing our faith and our lives as God's people. Before the ascension of Jesus, um, in Matthew 28 and 19, 20, thereabout, Jesus gave, this, gave the great commission to his disciples, and he said to them to go into the nations of the earth and make disciples of all nations. And so my first question to you is, as God's people, are you making disciples? It's really, really worth thinking about. Am I making disciples? Are you making disciples? That was the Great Commission. Are you? I'll let you think about that. Um, and what that speaks into is that we as God's people have a responsibility to share our faith, to share our lives with others. And it's part of what we've been speaking about, about God's, um, God's people. So over the last couple of um, weeks, we've been speaking about God's people and some of the qualities that are expected of God's people. We've spoken about giving, we've spoken about trusting, growing, relating, and this morning, like I said, we'll be speaking about sharing, or share as it were. Um, and Jesus really helps us unpack this um, subject of sharing. 
We're going to be reading from Matthew 5, from verses 13 to 16. So if you have your Bibles, can I please ask you to pull them out? Or it's going to be um, on the screen. Okay, if it's not going to be on the screen, if you have your Bibles, okay, lovely. I'd love for us to read together, if that's okay. Um, One, two, three, go. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Let your light shine for others, so they may see your good works. Give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Father God, we want to thank you for this morning. We want to ask that you breathe upon your word this morning. We want to ask that you bring life, you bring light, you bring illumination. Sweet Holy Spirit, I want to ask you that you move in this room, that you do what you've proposed what you've planned before the foundations of the earth. We want to ask that there will be salvation. We want to ask that there will be healing, there will be deliverance. In Jesus' name, amen. And so Jesus is saying to us here, he says, you are the light and you are the salt of the earth. And so in helping us to unpack how we as God's people share our faith, It says to us that we are the salt of the earth and we are the light of the earth. And I would like us to unpack this and we'll start looking at, we'll start from salt. Why salt? So if you look at the ministry and the life of Jesus, at different times you'd find Jesus using everyday stories, metaphors to drive home kingdom principles, to drive home um, spiritual principles. And so one one of that is, you know, salt and light. Why salt? In first century Palestine, which is the setting of you know, this story, um, Jesus speaking to his disciples, of course. In those days, salt was really, really important and an integral part of their everyday life. And you know what I find really interesting is, is that salt was really, really critical back then, but it is equally as important today. I'm sure some of us would have heard of um, Gordon Ramsay, the celebrity chef? Have you heard about Gordon Ramsay? Yes. And I'm sure some of us have watched um, his shows and you would see where Gordon, and I'm not you know, going to go into his style or you know, his words, no, I'm, not, I'm not going there. <laughs> but you see Gordon spit out and get really upset when people add too much salt or too little salt to food. And he just gets upset like, guys, But what that speaks into is the importance of salt. That salt brings flavor to our food. Shemi, my eight-year-old son, wouldn't touch his chips or his fries without salt. Daddy, can I have some salt? No, Shemi, can I have some salt? That speaks into the fact that salt brings flavor to our food. And so Jesus is making that comparison Comparison between us and salt, saying that we as his people are meant to be flavor enhancers, that we come into spaces, we come into relationships, and we are meant to bring God's flavor into that space. We're meant to bring God's flavor into that relationship. And so my question to you is, in the spaces and situations and relationships that you find yourself, do you bring God's flavor in? Do people see you and they say, yes, there is something about this person. They bring something to the the table. They bring something of God to the relationship. The other thing salt does is that it acts as a preservative. So back then, again, first century Palestine, they didn't have the luxury of refrigerators. They didn't have the luxury of, you know, fridge, freezers like we do today. And so... One key way they used in preserving the food, you know, was by salting their food. 
So whether it's, you know, whether it's their steak, whether it's their fish, grains, vegetables, you would find them salting um, these food items. Now, I might not have grown up in that time, in that era, in that day, but I grew up in a time back in Nigeria where power supply was really epileptic, it was very unstable. The Nigerians in the room would know what I'm talking about. And I had first-hand knowledge, first-hand experience of how my mom would, um, to preserve food, would deep fry, would salt the food, or would sun dry. So we had different ways. We would either deep fry some of these you know, food items, um, we would sun dry some of them, but I saw firsthand where my mom would salt meat, where, where my mom would salt meat to preserve that, um, to preserve that food item. And why, why, why do we need to preserve? We need to preserve so it doesn't decay. And so Jesus is saying to us, he's making that comparison here, that you and I are in this world to stop the decay going on. I mean, the world was decaying over 2,000 years ago. Now imagine how decayed the world is today. And so as salt and as light, we are meant to come into these spaces and bring God's flavor, but not just bring God's flavor, but to preserve the spaces that God has put us in. Now, someone might say to me, well, so Lani, how do we, how do we preserve? As children of God, as kingdom people, we come into spaces and we speak truth with grace. That we recognize that people are in different places. We come speaking truth, but we are gracious about it. Another way we preserve as God's people is that we stand interceding for the people around us. We stand interceding for the people God has placed around us, our communities, our schools, our colleagues at work. I remember growing up, um, when I was a teenager, I did what teenage, teenagers did, and I'm not going to go into details, but I did a lot of very foolish stuff. And... After I became a Christian, so I'm talking about when I was like 17, 18, did a lot of very, very foolish things. I met a gentleman who was friends with my sister um, after, I be- after I became a Christian, years after that. And he said to me, he said, Landry, I'm so glad you are now a Christian. He said, for one year, myself and your sister would meet and would pray for your salvation. I was shocked. We would meet and we would pray every day for your salvation. That is what we do as preservers. That is what we are called to do as salt, preserving and ensuring that decay is minimal or zero. Now we look into scriptures and you see the story of Abraham. Story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah had gone crazy. They, were, they had just gone crazy. And God had had enough. And he was going to destroy Sodom. And God said... Will I do something like this and not inform my friend? Can I say to us this morning, guys, we are God's friends. And he's trusting us to stand in gap. And so God went to Abraham and he said to Abraham, well, this is my plan. I'm going to destroy Sodom because of their ways. And Abraham went before God and he said, Lord, what if you find 50 people in Sodom? Would you still destroy? God said, no. Abraham went. Lord, What if you find 40 people? Abraham kept negotiating and pleading and interceding on behalf of Sodom and Gomorrah. So my question to us this morning is, how are we interceding for these people that God has placed around us? How are we standing in gap and saying, Lord, have mercy. Lord, bring salvation. Lord, cause a revival. You've not been put in the places and in the spaces that you are by accident. There is a divine orchestration that has brought you into, whether it's this city, whether it's your workplace, whether it's your community, there is a divine orchestration. And God is counting on us in those spaces to be the ones that would say no to decay, to be the ones that would say we would bring salt, we would bring flavor, we would bring God life into this space. The other thing Jesus compared us to, so he said you are salt, and he said you are light. The other thing he compared us to was light. What does light do? I'll give you a very vivid description 
of what light does. So remember my story about growing up in a time where power supply was epileptic. I remember back then we would sit, you know, myself and my siblings would sit, we would, so there, we, would, we wouldn't have um, power supply, we would have our lamps, our lanterns on, and we would sit anticipating, expecting, waiting for the power company to restore electricity. And whenever the power company restores electricity, there is a particular shout that goes out. Now I'm going to turn, I'm going to, turn to my Nigerian brothers. When electricity is restored, what do we say? Lovely. We go up Nepal. <laughs> and the entire neighborhood, the entire community just goes up Nepal. We just go crazy. And there is that joy because power supply has been restored. And what happens when electricity or when, when light comes? Light does a couple of things. It dispels darkness. Light comes into a place and darkness is gone. I'm sure a lot of people would struggle with that concept. But if we, if we turned off the light here for three minutes, you start shouting, can we please turn this thing on? But that was my reality back then. And that was the reality of these people back then in, in um, first century Palestine. But the point here is, Jesus is saying to us that we are meant to be those ones who come into a space and we bring God's light with us. Jesus said, I am the light of the world, and you are the light of the world. And so we come into spaces and we bring God's light. Light dispels darkness. Light helps us to see things as they should be. I mean, imagine reading where there was no light. It's, it's not really clear. But when light comes, it's really easy to see what I'm reading. The world today is in darkness. Again, Bible says darkness would cover the earth. It says God, gross darkness, the people. It's very clear in our world today. There is so much darkness going on. It is really dark. It is really, really dark. The culture of the world literally feels like it's leading people to hell. But Jesus is saying, that we come to bring God's light. We come to bring truth. We come to bring truth in grace. We come to show the world God's kindness. And you would have heard me repeat the word grace and truth. And I'll, and I'll, and I'll give some context. You see, when we come and we assault, if you apply a lot of salt in your food, the salt would, sorry, the food would lose its taste or its essence or the flavor. It becomes really hard to eat that food. That's what I feel happens when assault, we don't apply grace. We just speak the truth. Yes, this person knows the truth, but there is no grace. And so scripture says concerning Jesus that he was full of grace and of truth. And so my brothers, my sisters, my question to us is, in the spaces that God has placed us, do we bring God's flavor? Do we bring the light of God? Do we bring truth? Or do we just allow things to be as they are? So I'm going to talk about um, three, three no's and two yeses. How do, we re how do we retain our distinctiveness as salt and as light? In this world where, again, like I said, there's so much darkness, how do we retain our saltiness, and our light. The first is that we say no to copying. What are we saying no to? No to copying. We say no to copying the world's culture. The world's culture, what would it look like? It would look like the world's music, the world's fashion. It would look like things like that. And we are saying no to copying the world's culture. The Bible says that there is a path that seems right to a man, but the end is destruction. And so we are saying no to copying what the world gives or what the world offers. And the second thing we are saying no to is no to critiquing. Now, hear me. I am not saying we shouldn't express our displeasure at what is happening in the world. We should do that. But... When Jesus, when the woman caught in the act of adultery was brought to Jesus, Jesus could have gone, oh, you bloody adulteress. 
Jesus could have said all sort of things to her. But what did he do? Jesus showed grace and he spoke to her in truth. When Jesus encountered the woman at the um, well of Samaria, what did he do? Again, grace and truth. And so the world is lost. lost. You can't tell a barking dog to stop barking. Dogs bark. That's what they do as dogs. The world is lost. That is who they are as the world. And so the point is not for us to critique or criticize the world. The point is that we should bring something of God into those relationships instead of criticizing. And then the third, third thing is um, no to consuming the culture. Now, this is quite similar to copying the culture, so you could um, say that they are the same. But you see, the Bible says that, um, it says we're in this world, but we're not of, of this world. So we recognize that our kingdom is not of this world. We recognize that our kingdom is the kingdom of God. And it says that we should not be conformed to this world, but we should be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Meaning that there is a tendency to conform to the culture of the world. And so how do we address all of this? We'll look at two yeses. Two things to help us maintain our distinctiveness as salt and as light. The first is yes to creativity or yes to being creative. See, I love what happened a couple of um, weeks ago. Is it, a, is it a month? Yeah, it's a month now where we had a cultural night. And City Gate Church hosted, you know, over 500 people. We had believers, unbelievers different cultures, different colors in the room. And it gave us a good opportunity to actually show the world that as a church, we know how to have fun. You see, one of the reasons why I struggled with being a Christian back then was I thought the church was bland. I thought the church had no, no taste, no flavor. But I'm sure, I mean, some of my friends came in that day and they really loved it. It left a good taste in their mouth. And so if I need to speak to them about Jesus, it becomes really easy because they've been to church and they've seen us have fun. And so that is the church. I met a gentleman on Thursday here at church and he said to me, he said, oh, Landry, on, on, on the 22nd of um, 22nd of." of July, I'm going to be having a barbecue at my place and I'm going to have my, belie- my, my believer friends and my unbeliever friends. Now, these are creative ways. And he said, Larry, when these people come together, it will be an opportunity to share the gospel. It will be an opportunity to share about God. Now, we need to think about creative ways of sharing the gospel. I love Lisa's story. I really love that story. We all have stories of how God has saved us, of how God pulled us out of that dark pit. How are we sharing those stories? The other thing we would say yes to is yes to being cultivators. What are we cultivating? Remember, the world would present you its music, its culture, its values. But we are saying yes to kingdom culture. We are saying yes to kingdom values. What does that look like? We are saying yes to studying, spending time and just studying scriptures. So we are cultivating, studying scriptures, cultivating, spending time with God. We are saying yes to coming to church like this. We are saying yes to fasting. We are saying yes to separating ourselves and just seeking his face. Do you know what happens when you do that? The word of God begins to take root in your heart. The kingdom, uh, sorry, the culture of God's kingdom begins to permeate your heart. So much so that you go out and people notice a difference in you. It, it, it just, it's just there, that difference. There is something different, different about you. Your language is different. Your choices are different. And so my question to us is, what are we cultivating What values, what kingdom values, what kingdom principles, what kingdom truths are we cultivating? See, we can't change the world's culture in one day. 
But if we are intentional about it, if we are deliberate about it, by starting to cultivate the right culture in our homes, in our schools, it then becomes really easy to be an influence in our world. And I'm just going to, can I please ask the band to come up? I'm going to begin to wrap up by saying this. So John Maxwell said, salt makes things better, light makes things brighter. We have been called to make things better. We have been called to make things brighter. The Bible says in um, Colossians 4 and verse 6, it says, let your conversations be full of grace, seasoned with salt. Let your conversations be full of grace. Another translation says, let your conversations be full of grace and your talks be seasoned with truth. This is how we share the kingdom. This is how we sit with our friends and we bring God's kingdom by sharing truth in grace and in truth. Um, the band is going to sing in a moment. I'm going to allow us just spend time just reflecting on that and then I'll come up and I'll pray. I recognize there are a few practical things to speak into and to pray into. Mm-hmm.